بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم We continue the discussion on the hadith from عمدة الأحكام and we have reached hadith number 31 under the chapter of غسل of taking a bath and the hadith is عن عبد الله بن عمر بن الخط بن الخطاب رضي الله عنهما أن عمر قال للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا رسول الله أيرقد أحدنا وهو جنب قال نعم إذا توضأ أحدكم فليرقد عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه أست بقولهم كان أي من أوف أس سليب وايل هي إز جنب هي رد يس إف هي بيرفورمز أبلوشن and <coughs> Junub is uh, the person upon whom taking a bath or ghusl is an obligation whether it is due to sexual intercourse with the spouse or to ejaculation This is the meaning of junub. This is the meaning of junub. Being in a state of sexual defilement. The narrator of this hadith is Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, anhu. And we gave a biography of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in hadith number 13 earlier. The subject of this hadith. The subject is the ruling, explaining the ruling on the sleep of the person who is in a state of janaba, in a state of sexual defilement. And now we know what is janaba and what is a junub. Now the overall explanation. Since sleep is a lesser death and since Janaba is a, a greater ritual impurity and so the person may die in a state of sleep while being in this major state of impurity. So if it is lightened by way of taking ablution, then that was ta that takes precedence instead of sleeping in a major state of impurity. So here, the leader of the believers, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, asked as to whether the person should go into sleep while in this state of major state of impurity. And this is his son, Abdullah bin Umar relates from his father that he asked the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam about this matter and he sallallahu alayhi wasallam made it clear that this is permissible if the person reduces the state from the greater state of impurity to the lesser one by way of taking ablution the benefits of this hadith first the keenness of the Sahaba, the companions, to ask about things when they are, when there is a need for that, when there is a need for that. And when the companions ask and they are informed concerning the legal ruling, they will hasten to comply in contrast to our state in these times where many 
except the few whom Allah had mercy upon, who ask only for the sake of knowing with little, if any, compliance with the rulings. And this is a, an important difference. And another important difference is that when the Sahaba ask and they are given the ruling, they don't go into depth of asking whether this is an obligation or praiseworthy or recommended. They hasten to comply. They hasten to comply. In contrast to the state of many in our times, who go, the first question after, or when they raise, is this mandatory, is this praiseworthy, is this recommended, is this, is, is this, is this, etc. Now, <clears throat> the second point of benefit, the permissibility to sleep while in a state of sexual defilement or junub, if the person makes wudu, wudu, now, is this an obligation? Now, we can ask, is this an obligation or is this a recommendable matter? Some, there is ikhtilaf, there is, a diff there is difference of opinion about it. Some of the scholars consider this narration to indicate that it is an obligation. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا تَوَضَّ If he performs wudu. So therefore, he conditioned that this would be allowable and conditioned it with the if and thus they concluded that this what is understood is that if he does not perform the wudu then in this case he should not go to sleep the second opinion and this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars is that this is a praiseworthy and recommended matter and they took as evidence is what is related by Imam Ahmad and Ahlul Sunan that he sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to sleep while in a state of sexual defilement in Janaba without touching water and that his action indicates that this is permissible that this is permissible a third opinion is that it is disliked to sleep while in a state of janaba. And the preponderating opinion is that it is mustahab, it is recommended to make wudu before sleeping in a state of sexual defilement, to lighten that to the lesser degree. But the perfected state is that the person does not go, not go to sleep until he performs the ghusl. Until he or she performs the ghusl, the bath, take the bath. So that the person sleeps uh, in a complete state of purification and purity. Because it may be that otherwise he may miss the fajr prayer if he wakes up uh, in a time close to the dawn break and then if he goes to make the ghusl he may miss the congregational prayer and the wudu the making wudu lightens the janaba this is another benefit lightens the state of sexual defilement and that's why the prophet sallallahu commanded that and the companions used to make wudu and they used to sleep while in the state of Janaba in the masjid after making wudu and the ritual impurities are two types lesser and greater The lesser is that which necessitates wudu. The lesser is that which necessitates wudu. And under the state of lesser impurity, lesser ritual impurity, 
The following matters or the following things are forbidden. Number one, to perform salah in this state. The second, touching the mushaf. And there is ikhtilaf in this matter. The third is <coughs> performing tawaf. Also, there is ikhtilaf in this matter. Now, as to the a greater state of impurity, the first three plus the following. The first three plus the following. Staying in the masjid, staying in the mosque. However, if he performs wudu, then he may stay. The, the, this would be number four, therefore. And number five would be reciting the Quran. This is other than touching the mushaf. Because of the hadith of Ali that nothing prevented him from the Quran except the state of Janaba. These are the benefits of this hadith and then we move inshallah now to hadith number 32, the hadith of Umm Salama. An Umm Salama radiyallahu ta'ala anha qalat Jaat Umm Sulaym imra'atu Abi Talha إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت يا رسول الله إن الله لا يستحي من الحق فهل على المرأة من غسل إذا هي احتلمت قال نعم إذا هي رأت الماء إذا هي رأت الماء okay. so in this hadith Umm Salama radiyallahu ta'ala anha narrated Umm Salama may Allah be pleased with her <coughs> Umm al-Mu'mineen the mother of the believers she said that Jaat Umm Sulaym imra'atu Abi Talha Umm Sulaym the wife of Abu Talha may Allah be pleased with all of them came to Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said O oh Allah's messenger Verily, Allah is not shy of telling the truth. Is it necessary for a woman to take a bath after she has a wet dream? Nocturnal sexual discharge or in a dream. This is called ihtilam. And ihtilam means to see herself in a sexual intercourse, engaged in a sexual intercourse in the dream. Allah's Messenger وسلم, replied, yes, if she notices a discharge. The narrator of this hadith, Ihtilam, Ihtilam, is Umm al -Mu'mineen. Umm Salama. Her name is Hind bint Abi Umayya, Hudayfa ibn Mughira al Qurashiya, al Mahzumiya, radiyallahu anha. She accepted Islam early. She and her husband Abu Salama. And he, Abu Salama, was the son of the Prophet and and his brother from suckling. He died and left her. He died after the expedition of Uhud. And she used to love him. And he is her cousin. So she said after his death, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong and to Him we shall return. Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlifli khayran minha. O Allah, give me reward in my 
calamity and help me and give me better than that. Believing, she said that, believing in the saying of the Prophet ﷺ that whoever says this upon a calamity that befalls him, then Allah will give him better and will reward him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, gave her best. The Prophet ﷺ engaged Um Salama after she completed her waiting period, after she completed her idda, and he married her in the fourth year after Hijra. She was a woman of sound intellect and good thoughts and of true faith. She died in the year 62 after Hijra. And she was the last to die from the wives of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. May Allah be pleased with all of them. This is Umm Salama's biography. She said that Umm Sulaim and Umm Sulaim is Sahla bint Milhan al Ansariya. Um Anas bin Malik, the mother of Anas bin Malik. She accepted Islam early with her people from the Ansar. So her husband became angry. Her husband Malik became angry. So he left to a Sham area and then he died there. Then Abu Talha asked for her hand. She said, إِنْ أَسْلَمْتَ تَزَوَّجْتُكْ وَلَا أُرِيدُ مِنْكَ صَدَاقًا غَيْرَهُ If you accept Islam, I will marry you. And I don't need any dowry other than that from you. And so he accepted Islam. <coughs> And her son, <coughs> Anas bin Malik, concluded the covenant for her. He married his mother to Abu Talha. May Allah be pleased with them all. And she also was a woman of sound judgment and intellect and very firm heart and of great etiquette and deen. May Allah be pleased with her. Umm Sulaim, the wife of Abi Talha. And he, Abu Talha, is Zayd bin Sahl al-Ansari al-Khazraji from the great companions who attended the Battle of Badr and the battle of Uhud. And he gave in Sadaqah the most beloved property to him. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed his saying of three in mind in Al Imran Lantanal Birra Hatta Tunfiku Mimma Tuhibun. By no means shall you attain al-birr, piety and righteousness until you spend in Allah's cause of that which you love. And whatever of good you spend, Allah knows it well. So he gave the best of his property, most beloved to him, as a charity. رضي الله تعالى عنه. May Allah be pleased with him. He died around the year 50 
after Hijra. He died around the year 50 after Hijra. The subject of this hadith, explaining the ruling concerning Ghusl, the bath, following Ihtilam, Following, following ihtilam, having a what dream, due to sexual intercourse, in a dream. The overall explanation, the overall explanation. Um al-Mu'mineen, Umm Salama, radiallahu anha, narrates, from Umm Sulaym al Ansariya, radiallahu ta'ala anha, that she came to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam asking him about the woman if she sees herself in the dream having sexual intercourse. Is there ghusl upon her? Is she required to take a bath? This is a question which prevents many women to be explicit about. But because of the love of Um Sulaim to the knowledge and her eagerness to know the ruling so that she can worship Allah based on sound knowledge, she came and she expressed this explicitly. And she introduced some wording before that as a prelude for her quote excuse when she said inna allaha la yastahyi min al haqq Allah is not shy is not bashful when it comes to the truth so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not shy of this so let us ask about the truth wherever it may be and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered her that when the woman goes through ihtilam this dream, this type of dream is that she must take a ghusl, a bath with the condition that she sees the semen that she sees the semen discharge. That she sees the semen discharge. The benefits of this hadith. First benefit. The merit of Um Sulaim because of her keenness to have fiqh in the deen, understanding of the deen. And her good manner and etiquette of introducing the question and in seeking the knowledge. The second benefit affirming the attribute of haya bashfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Since in this hadith there is a negation that Allah is not shy concerning the truth, then this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shy or is qualified with the attribute of bashfulness when it comes to other than that. And this is the creed of Ahl Sunnah. This is the creed of Ahl Sunnah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described with haya, with bashfulness. And this is a true and affirmed attribute to Allah. Affirmed in a way that fits His majesty. His bashfulness is not like ours. The difference between His bashfulness and ours is like the difference between his self and ours. 
So we affirm the attribute of bashfulness to Allah Azza wa Jal in the manner that suits His Majesty and that it does not resemble the bashfulness of the created. And the Prophet والسلام, affirmed the attribute of bashfulness to Allah when he said, In Allah Hayyun Kareem. Allah, verily, He is Hayy, bashful, Kareem, generous. Yastahyi min abdihi, is shy. Ida rafa ilayhi yadayhi an yaruddahuma sufra, or sifra. That He is shy to return the dua of the slave when he raises his hands to him, return them empty. So in this hadith, there is an affirmation that in Allah Hayyun Kareem, that Allah is Hayy, bashful, and generous. Now, if someone says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not to be described except in that which is perfect. So, is bashfulness an attribute of perfection? The answer is, yes, it is perfection. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-haya'u shu'batun min al-iman. Bashfulness is a branch of faith. And faith is perfection. And also in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا أَدْرَكَ النَّاسُ مِنْ كَلَامِ النُّبُوَّةِ الْأُولَىٰ إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاصْنَعْ مَا شئت. From the things which people comprehend from the words of Prophetic words, the first prophetic words of the past. إذا لم تستحي فاسمع ما شئ. إذا لم تستحي, if you are not bashful or shy, then do whatever you wish. Meaning, the first meaning of this hadith is that the one who is not shy will do anything and will not care. This is one meaning. The second correct meaning of this hadith is well. If you intend to do something while there is nothing bashful or, or there is nothing shameful of doing it, then do it. And both meanings are correct. And both meanings are correct. So from this altogether we affirm that the attribute of perfection, the attribute of bashfulness is a is an affirmed attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that fits His majesty and it is perfection. Now if someone asks, is it from bashfulness that the person keeps silent about something from the religion which is a problematic, which is problematic to him? The answer is no. This is not from bashfulness. This is not from bashfulness. This is cowardice and weak character. What's beautiful is that the person should ask about everything related to it, his deen, especially after the discontinuity of revelation, following the death of the Prophet والسلام, So there is no revelation now to come, making this halal, making this haram, obligation or not obligated so let the people ask and not be shy yes of course if a matter it is, it, then if someone is shy about explicitly stating the matter then let him give an indication however if it is a matter which must However, if it's a matter that requires explicitly so that it can be understood, 
then in this case, the person should do that. And if it is, if it, if it can be done in private, then there is no harm. But to turn that down when it is needed to be explicit about it and say that this is bashfulness, no. Because it is a duty bound upon the Muslim to ask the people of knowledge if they don't know. But asking the people of knowledge also has etiquettes and has manners. One should not go and check the same question to three or four people of knowledge in order to suit or seek an answer that fits his or her inclinations. This is forbidden because this would be a play. Ask those whom you trust their knowledge because they are reliable and they are known to have knowledge that is based upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the authentic one, in accordance, of course, the understanding of the early Muslims or the righteous predecessors, rahimahumullah, and those who are known to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what they say. The third benefit, women have what dreams like men. The fourth benefit, احتلام, having these wet dreams, without discharge, does not necessitate ghusl, does not necessitate ghusl. Even if the person feels the enjoyment or the pleasure, but nothing is discharged, then there is no ghusl obligated upon the person, because the Prophet ﷺ restricted it if she sees the discharge. The fifth benefit, the woman, and similarly the man, if she sees after awakening the remains of Janaba and he or she are certain that it is a semen discharge, then it is obligatory to take the bath even if they don't remember having a wet dream having ihtilam because the Prophet ﷺ made the ruling center upon seeing the semen discharge and therefore this necessitates that whenever the semen discharge is seen then ghusl is obligated The sixth benefit, ghusl is not obligated if the, due to the movement of the semen within, as long as it is not discharged, as long as it is not discharged. And this is the preponderating opinion. And this is the preponderating opinion. Again, for the same reason, in which the Prophet ﷺ restricted the obligation for taking the bath upon seeing the discharge. And because the thing within 
is not considered anything in terms of the ruling. You know, our bodies are filled with urine and uh, feces and there is no ruling to take a bath because of their movement before they are discharged. So this for, therefore, this hadith indicates that if a person feels the movement of the semen because of a strong sexual desire, but nothing is discharged, then there is no ghusl upon him. No ghusl upon him. Does the same thing hold true with respect to the movement of menses? the natural blood of menses, meaning if the woman feels the movement of menses but there is no blood discharged, would the same ruling also apply? The preponderating opinion is yes. And now we can recognize the benefit of this. Take for example, a woman who is fasting. She feels that her menses is moving on her before the sun sets. Before the sun sets. But there is no discharge until after the sun had set. So, according to this correct, according to this preponderating opinion, her fasting is correct, is valid, because there is no discharge except until after the sun has set. The seventh benefit, there is no obligation to take the bath when there is doubt when there is doubt. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا رَأَتِ الْمَأْ If she sees, and he didn't say, if she um, thought it may be, but rather he said, if she sees. So therefore, if Anyone awakes from his sleep and sees wetting and he does not know whether this is due to sweating or urine or medi or other fluid or semen then there is no whistle upon him. Should he, however, is it obligatory upon him, however, to wash this sweating, this sweat, wetting? The answer is yes. He washes this as a precaution. As to the whistle, to the bath, no, it is not mandatory. And the same holds whether this wetting was after a state of a sleep in which there was sexual arousement or the like, it is no difference. There is no difference. As long as there is the doubt, then the origin and the principle is that it is not a certain matter. From the benefits of this hadith, 
and this is a great benefit, that the Islamic Sharia is based upon realities and not upon delusions and not about on doubt. So, this is a very important benefit, one of the great benefits of Islam, so that the person stays free of worries, unperplexed, And if this is not maintained, then he would live his life in delusion, endless delusions. However, in matters where the person is required to do certain things, and it becomes that it is most likely to him that he did it, then that is sufficient. And that's, that is sufficient. So, for example, if he doubts that he, he, if he doubts whether he completed first uh, or completed seven rounds around the Kaaba or six, and it was most likely to him that it was seven, then it is seven. Similarly in Salah, if he doubts whether he prayed three or four, However, what was most likely to him that it was four, then it is four. The difference between salah and tawaf, however, is that salah requires sujood sahu in case of doubt, the sujood of forgetfulness in case of doubt. But in terms of tawaf, there is no sujood in that case. What's important therefore is, that, is this, this is a ni'mah, a favor of Allah upon us, that the Sharia combats worries, and this is from the ease bestowed upon us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know from the hadith, about the person and this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and in Bukhari volume 1 hadith 139 about a person who imagined to have passed wind during Salah about the person who imagined to have passed wind during Salah Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he should not leave his salah, his prayers unless he hears sound or smells something. This hadith has an additional narration from Muslim. The hadith we are talking about from Umdat al-Ahkam the hadith we are discussing, hadith number 32, there is an addition from the way of Muslim in the narration reported by Muslim when Um Salama asked would this really take place? In meaning a woman going into uh, having seen an, in ihtilam and woman having seen an, discharge she asked and the Prophet sallallahu said naam yes famin ayna yakunu shabah he said yes once comes that similarity whence whence comes that similarity exclamation so 
similarity of the of the child to his you know to his father or mother etc as we will discuss that's what the Prophet ﷺ said in the answer so from this also here we have a benefit here the permissibility to check the things even with the great ones the similar the 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 permissibility to check things even with the great ones meaning Islam had given the freedom to a check and search for the matter which one is possible to comprehend is possible to comprehend when she said would this really be meaning concerning the discharge she was addressing the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam so she was trying to check on that how could this be would it really take place so therefore it is permissible to ask about these things which are possible to comprehend even ask those who are great but asking about things which there is no way to know the how then this is wrong and this reminds us of the incident with Imam Malik may Allah's mercy be upon him concerning the one who asked about how the istiwa of Allah is how is the manner in which Allah arose over the throne so Imam Malik asked answered him as su'alu anhu bid'a asking about the how is an innovation because this is cannot be comprehended so Um Sulaim was asking to know of that which can be comprehended now the next benefit the humbleness of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. great humbleness here is his wife talking asking Hal yakunu hada? would this really be and someone may think that she was objecting no we mentioned earlier that she wants just to discover and know and if any one of us would think about himself now if his wife asks him about these things and then he tells her do this and do that and then if she says how would this be possible what would one of us say this tells us of the great moral character of the Prophet والسلام, and his great conduct and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take him in reality as our example in this and all of that and to make us from those who reflect upon their shortcomings and errors in terms of their treatment to their so when we learn these things and we come to know this is from the example of the Prophet والسلام, and this is from his character what is intended here is that we comply and we apply not just to have it like a theoretical knowledge what would the benefit be we should exert the effort indeed sincerely and put our false pride aside we continue inshallah the uh, discussion we have reached uh, uh, the 11th uh, point of benefit from the benefits of this hadith is the word yes stands as a perfect statement the word yes stands as a perfect statement 
And this was evident in the answer of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This world, yes, can even work to the extent that <coughs> if the wali of the woman, the guardian, says to the person asking her hand, زوجتك ابنتي I give you my daughter in marriage and the people present ask him and say do you accept and if he says yes then this is considered as legal acceptance and if a person is asked did you and if a person is asked did you divorce your wife and he says yes then this is considered also a divorce the next point of benefit which is number 12 the eloquence of the Arabic language the eloquence of the Arabic language using few or using words with few letters standing as perfect statements. The thirteenth benefit, the similarity in terms of the offspring can be for both parents. However, sometimes the resemblance or the similarity of the son or the daughter is more towards the father's side and sometimes the opposite and sometimes equal and sometimes neither this nor that but most often is the former cases mostly to the father or to the mother or equally both the fourteenth benefit that the person may have similarity to his maternal uncles to his maternal uncles because if he is inclined towards his mother in similarity then his mother, her similarity is towards her family side. So therefore, he would be inclined to similarity with his maternal uncles. And this is a perceived reality. It's, a, it's an occurrence. And it's also evident from the hadith of the Bedouin. The Bedouin who said, to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, O Messenger of Allah, my wife gave birth to a black boy. Meaning he was like asking the Prophet, how could this, when both parents are white and they gave birth to a black boy? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him Hallaka min ibl Do you have Or have you got camels? Have you got camels? He said yes The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Ma alwanuha What colors are they? What colors are they? The man, the Bedouin said, red. He said, red. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, هَلْ فِيهَا مِنْ أَوْرَقْ Is there any gray one among them? Is there a gray one among them? The man said, yes, 
The Prophet ﷺ said, من أين أتاها Once comes that, once comes that, the man replied, لعله نزعه عرق Maybe it is because of heredity. Maybe it's because of heredity. So the Prophet ﷺ said, فَابْنُكَ لَعَلَّهُ نَزَعَهُ عَرْقُ Maybe your latest son has his color because of heredity. And this is in Bukhari and Muslim. And in Bukhari it is 7.225. So similarity could be in color in perplexions, in peripheries like fingers, palms, uh, feet, and the like, from the side of the father, or from that of the mother's side, in similarity. And that's why when Mujazzar al-Mudlaji when he saw the feet of Zayd bin Haritha and his son Usama, he saw their feet where, while they were covered and their feet coming out from under the cover, he said he saw their feet, he didn't see them, he didn't know who, who they who who they were. So he said, In هَذِهِ الْأَقْدَامِ بَعْضُهَا مِنْ بعض. These uh, feet are from one another. So, the similarity can have different uh, ways to it or in different manners. In, in perflection, in uh, color, in peripheries, etc. The fifteenth benefit, uh, giving various proofs, giving various proofs regarding a certain matter. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the answer, he said yes, and this is a legal dalil, legal evidence, which is sufficient for every believer. Then he added a physical evidence, a physical proof. When he said, فَمِنْ أَيْنَ يَكُونُ الشَّبَهِ Otherwise, where would the, once the, the similarity comes from? And therefore, this brings another benefit, that the dalil that using proofs which would be convincing uh, from the legal and from the physical angles also from the intellectual side if possible because the more the evidences are presented then the more the person would feel comfortable and this great matter is vividly illustrated in the situation with Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam when he said Rabbi arini kayfa tuhyi al-mawta oh Allah show me how you bring life to the dead Allah said awalam tu'min yani, aren't you uh, believing he said certainly walakin liyatma'inna qalbi so that uh, I feel yani, uh, more certain, stronger in faith. So because you know, what, what's examined uh, and, 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 and seen is not as what is brought in information or in news.
So Allah showed him. So Allah showed him. In the example of the birds. In the next verse in 2.2.6.1 قَالَ فَخُذْ أَرْبَعَةً مِنَ الطَّيْرِ Take four birds, then cause them to incline towards you, then slaughter them, cut them into pieces, and then put a portion of them on every hill and call them. They will come to you in haste, and know that Allah is Almighty always. The, f the last point of benefit, it may be taken as a kind of evidence for meaning t if uh, similarity can be taken as a kind of evidence for affirming the lineage for affirming lineage because he said فَمِنْ أَيْنَ يَكُونُ الشَّبَهِ whence, come, whence similarity comes from what? what is what stands as a support for this this is supported in the story of Utba bin Abi Waqqas the brother of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas and the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim and in Bukhari volume 3 there's uh, uh, number rather 269 Utba bin Abi Waqqas took a firm promise from his brother Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas to take the son of the slave girl of Zama'a into his custody as he was his meaning Utba's son because Utba committed adultery or zina and he had the son from this zina so up one after he died there was a dispute between his brother Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas and Abd bin Zama concerning this custody of this son so in the year of the conquest of Mecca Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas took him and said that he was his brother's son and his brother took a promise from him to that effect now Abd bin Zama got up and said he is my brother and the son of my father the slave girl and was born on my father's bed then they both went to the Prophet Sallallahu So Sa'ad said, O Messenger of Allah, Umdur Shabaha, look for his similarity. So the Prophet ﷺ looked and he found a, a clear resemblance with Utbah bin Abi Waqqas. He passed this similarity, but however, he based the ruling, the ruling on a greater and stronger cause, and that is the bed. So when they both went to the Prophet ﷺ said, Sa'ad said, O oh Allah's Messenger, he is the son of my brother and he has taken a promise from me that I will take him. Now Abd bin Zam'a said, he is my brother and the son of my father's slave girl and was born on my father's bed, Allah's Messenger said, the boy is for you, O Abd bin Zam'a. Though he saw the resemblance, the Prophet ﷺ, but he went for the ruling which is based upon a greater cause, and that is the bed. When he said the son is for the bed, meaning the man on whose bed he was born, and stones being to be stoned to death, for the one who has done illegal sexual intercourse. So he affirmed that this son goes to 
that he is a brother for now for whom for Sauda bin Zam'a now he now she is the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu however the Prophet Sallallahu still considered the resemblance with Utbah so that's why the Prophet Sallallahu said to his wife Sauda to screen herself from that boy as he noticed a similarity between the boy and Utbah Utbah bin Abi Waqqas and the boy did not see her till he died this is from a precautionary stand due to the resemblance so this indicates that resemblance can be taken into consideration in rulings whereby a precautionary stance may be the outcome. Wallahu ta'ala ala wa alam wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. This brings the end of the discussion on this hadith, the hadith from Umdat al-Ahkam, hadith 31 and 32. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم